From the earliest age that I can remember becoming a park, ranger was my life goal. My father and I spent every free weekend hiking, fishing, and camping in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Not everyone is as lucky as we were to have access to 560,000 acres of pristine woodland streams and hiking trails, but with it being a 20-minute drive, we practically lived there from Friday to Sunday evening. While I could recount hundreds of stories of our exploits in the park, I think it would be best if I stick with the information pertinent to the dangers I want to warn you of. When I was about ten years old, my father and I had just finished setting up camp for the night. Our tent was placed, the latrine dug, and our campfire was burning warmly in front of us. After a heavy dinner and canteen of water, the call of nature indicated it was time to use the restroom. I wandered to the hole we had dug away from the campground and relieved myself. As I was zipping my jeans, there was soft whistling coming from the forest ahead of me. Looking over my shoulder, I could see my father, pipe in mouth, sitting on the ground by our fire. Turning my head back to the direction of the whistling, I squinted my eyes and peered into the distance to try and identify the source of the whistling. It was likely a bird, I thought to myself, but there were hints of a subtle melody that kept me from being certain. The fading light of the sun didn't provide me with much of a view, so I continued listening to the soft whistling. Having decided it warranted no further investigation, I resolved to return to the safety of my father's company and the now much desired illumination of our campfire. I turned around and began to shuffle through the undergrowth of the forest, when over my shoulder I was certain I heard someone shout from a distance. It's this way. Come and see. My fight, flight, or freeze response immediately chose the worst of all the options as I stopped dead in my tracks. Turning around quickly, I look in the distance and saw what I thought was the silhouette of a waving person far in the distance. They didn't call out again, but it appeared a single arm continued to wave in above their head before they eventually dropped it and stepped backward, disappearing behind a monstrously large oak tree. Without another thought, I bolted the short distance back to our campsite, and in a panic told my father what I thought I had seen and heard. He smiled and reassured me it was likely nothing more than another camper, but he would investigate. Shouldering the strap of his rifle and digging his flashlight out of his bag, we trekked into the woods in the direction I thought I had seen the figure. My heart hammered against my chest as we slowly made gains in that direction. As we neared the massive oak I had seen from the latrine, my father began to sweep the ground with the beam of the flashlight searching for signs of a disturbance. There was no sign of recent activity. The dried leaves and fallen branches seemed to be completely undisturbed. We continued maybe a quarter of a mile beyond the oak and still found no sign of another camp or any human activity at all. My father ruffled my hair with his hand and assured me it had just been my mind playing a trick on me. I wanted to believe him so badly, but something in my heart told me I had seen someone or more unsettling yet. Something... After getting back to our camp and settling beside the dwindling embers of our fire, my father did something he had never done before. He began telling me a ghost story. In these woods, he started, people for over a century had told each other tales of wanderers in the woods. Beautiful melodies whistled in through the trees. Strangers in the distance would wave and beckon travelers to come and see incredible things. Anyone foolish enough to follow them vanished, never to be seen again. Not understanding why he would tell me these things, I began to panic, and tears pooled in the corners of my eyes. Seeing the visible discomfort, my father smiled and told me that as a boy he thought he had seen the same things too. My grandfather had told him the same story when he was my age, or perhaps a bit younger. Every time they would tread the same trails that he and I hike now, he always imagined hearing or seeing the wanderers in the woods. When he told my grandfather what he had heard and seen, he took it as an opportunity to teach him that the whistling sound was a known call of a local bird. He would also find shapes in the distance and show him how inanimate objects at a distance could produce the illusion of a man or woman watching them. I began to calm down a bit. We were deep within a massive national forest, and the odds of encountering another person was slim at best. My youthful fears had gathered natural occurrences around me and organized them into an unnerving and unlikely scenario. I eased my posture substantially and smiled thankfully at my father. 
In all of our trips together after that, I never had the same experience again. When I began work as a park ranger at Fire Tower 1, the experiences became so much worse than my younger self could have ever imagined. Part 2. I had just finished college with a degree in wildlife conservation not long before the start of the pandemic. Needless to say, this was not a kind time for new graduates. A local pizzeria near campus had provided me steady hours and a decent paycheck throughout my studies, but with increasing CDC recommendations and closures. My hours had dwindled to a quarter of what I had previously worked, being hundreds of miles from home and the not. So proud owner of a rapidly dwindling bank account, I spent hours each day filling out job applications, sending out resumes, and cold-calling every national park and forest I could locate online. Desperation was mounting daily until I had finally resolved to pack up my belongings and move back to my hometown, tail between my legs. My parents had passed away in a car accident during my sophomore year. I wouldn't be returning to a stable support system, but I was at least confident that old friends and extended family may be able to help me find gainful employment and find steady footing in my post-college life. Moving day arrived, and I finished boxing up the last of my possessions and stacking them haphazardly into the back of a rented box truck. After barely managing to get my beater of a car secured into the car, Tao Dali, on the back of the truck, I could feel my phone buzz in my pocket. Slumping down onto the tailgate of the box truck, I fished it out and saw a red notification bubble on my mail application and clicked it. The feeling of joy I experienced can't be accurately described as I read the attached email. Arlo Bennett National Forest Hiring Authority to Hurredacted Agacted Curredacted Com. Subject. Your application has been chosen for Fire Tower 1 in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Mr. Aradaredacted, congratulations and welcome to our team here at Arlo Bennett National Forest. We are excited to inform you that, as a new park ranger for wildlife services, you will be stationed at Fire Tower 1. You are expected to arrive at Ranger Station 3 at address redacted on overdate, redacted on before 800S. Uniforms, equipment, shelter, and necessities will be provided as this is a 24-7 live-in posting. If you require storage for personal items you do not wish to keep in your on-site residence, accommodations will be made upon arrival. Please bring a valid driver's license, social security card, and a copy of this email to be presented upon arrival. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please contact your HAR representatives at e contact your HR representatives at e phone number redacted during the hours 800 est and 1730 We thank you for your time and look forward to meeting you. Welcome to the team, Dennis Garland. Superintendent I. I. Arlo Bennett National Forest. After reading the email over and over and over no less than ten times, tears began to run down my cheeks. Only minutes ago, I was preparing to drive a box truck full of my second-hand furniture and meager possessions pointlessly toward my old hometown, but now I couldn't wait to travel down the road to my new career and what I thought would be a bright future. Two days, and one terrible roadside motel later... I pulled the box truck into a nearly empty parking lot in front of a log-sided building with a sign reading Ranger Station. Three, two, well jet jeeps sat parked side by side in front of the station, both marked clearly as Ranger Patrol vehicles. I couldn't help but smile. Here I was, right where I had always wanted to be. With a mixed sensation of pride and terror, I made my way into the Ranger Station and introduced myself to a man with salt and pepper hair sitting at the desk in the entryway. I introduced myself and was greeted with a vice grip of a handshake, and he identified himself as Superintendent Garland. He explained to me that while he was generally not stationed at this location, he made it a goal to personally meet every, neat, every newly hired ranger and walk them through the introductory process. Over the next few hours, we filled out a seemingly endless pile of paperwork, drank bad coffee out of chipped mugs, and I listened intently to Superintendent Garland as he explained my job duties at Fire Tower 1. None of the duties sounded unusual in any way to start. I would work in a 3x3 three three grid with Fire Towers 1 to 9. For the first two weeks of the month, I would man the tower from 500 to 1700. A reserve staff member would report to the station to give you a day off to readjust your sleep schedule for the last half of the month. 
The following two weeks, I would work from 1,700 to 500 to 500. Each tower in the grid was staggered by the shift to watch neighboring off-duty sectors around them, as well as their own. The primary concern was to watch for the inception of forest fires. Lighting strikes and unauthorized campfires were a constant concern in this area, so 24-hour surveillance was necessary. All fire tower rangers were provided with a two-bedroom, one-bathroom cabin located at the base of the tower. The cabins were fully furnished, and basic sundries were provided for your first week on the job, with the expectation you will provide your groceries and toiletries thereafter. Routine maintenance of the cabin and tower was to be performed by the occupying ranger. Mr. Garland also informed me that I would work four weeks on duty with one full week off duty. Reserve staff would report to the cabin at each tower to relieve the primary attendant to allow them some rest and relaxation. The second bedroom was to be reserved for them, and we were to keep it free of personal items. One exemption to this rule was in the event a camper or hiker was retrieved during a search and rescue until they could be evacuated to the nearest town by medical staff. As he wrapped up, I was smiling ear to ear. Dream job. Check. Rent. Free living. Check. After a worrying season in my life, everything seemed to be going my way. I was already making a mental checklist of what personal items to keep in the cabin and what I would need to store in the provided shed when Mr. Garland's gruff voice unexpectedly pulled out my daydream. One more thing, he said, eyes locking with mine. Don't travel any farther than a half mile or so north of Tower One. Oh, sure thing, I replied. I replied. No problem at all, but is there any particular reason? Mr. Garland stared at me in silence for a moment, and I could tell he was trying to sort out and answer. Dangerous woods that way, son, he finally responded. Bobcats and bears. Nasty business. I nodded politely, but it wasn't a terribly satisfying answer. My father and I had camped in this very forest for years, and had always known predatory wildlife lived throughout the entirety of the reserve area. Unless the bobcats had learned to ride the bears to hunt people down, it seemed unlikely to be any more dangerous than any other area. Regardless, it seemed like a poor plan to argue or question my new employer at that moment. He shook my hand and gave me a few pointers as he walked me to the door. I picked up a duffel bag they had prepared for me that was sitting in a chair by the door. Heading out to the box truck, I tried to reignite my excitement and invigoration for my new job, but the warning Superintendent Garland had given me still circled inside my mind ominously, don't go north. At that moment, I fully intended to adhere to the direction, but soon enough. Part 3. My first week at the cabin and tower was a whirlwind of information. The ranger currently occupying my new tower, Thomas, was a reserve ranger who filled in the off weeks of fire towers one to three. As he helped me unload my box truck and unhook my car, I picked his brain for every piece of advice I could think to ask for. He had worked for the ranger service here for a little less than a decade. I was surprised to learn that he had originally been offered the permanent role in Fire Tower 1, a significant pay increase from reserve status, but had declined stating that he loved traveling to the different towers and changing the scenery. He seemed like a very genuine and helpful man, but at the back of my mind I couldn't help but wonder if whatever could be found at the north of the tower drove him to decline the position. So, do you ever do any hiking or camping when you're off duty? I asked on our last day together as we sat in the lookout booth of the fire tower. Yeah, at least once a month or so. Thomas replied. I'd say I've probably hiked or explored everything within about five miles of the fire towers. This seemed like as good a chance as any to naturally ask Thomas about the area north of the tower. I've got a pretty good grasp of the territory to the east, south, and west, but is there much worth checking out north of the tower? I looked intently in his direction, but he never returned my gaze. Thomas stood up quickly and began to pack his hiking bag and supplies without making eye contact. He tossed the filled bag over his shoulder and made his way to the door with the wrap around stairs. Once he had made it out of the door, he turned and looked at me with a determined face. North of the tower isn't safe, buddy. He turned and began to walk down the stairs toward his jeep. Bobcats and bears that way. Stay clear. A few seconds later, I could hear the roar of an engine and the sound of gravel scattering beneath tires as his jeep made its way down the road. 
I was surprised by his sudden departure and lack of formal farewell. It wasn't as if I wouldn't see him again in three weeks when he returned to give me my days off, but for such a friendly guy it seemed like a rude exit. A bit of clarity from Thomas had been what I was anticipating, but now I was just left with a lead weight in my stomach and a slight feeling of dread. The answer had been so quick it seemed as though he had practiced it, matched with the dash for the door. I was sure something worse than wildlife must be located somewhere in these woods. That evening, after my shift had ended, I radioed the two towers in my grid that would be assuming the night watch to verify they were safely on shift. After receiving an affirmative message from both, I began to shut down all of the tower equipment other than the radio and gather up my belongings. There was still a bit of daylight left, so I seized the opportunity to grab a few odds and ends from the storage shed to bring into the cabin. My personal quarters were mostly organized and settled, but there was still a barren bookshelf in the corner that was begging for some of my tattered paperbacks to occupy. I dumped the old cardboard box on the floor by the bookshelf and squatted down until my rear made contact with the hardwood floor. Sitting in a cross-legged fashion, I opened the box and began to scoop out the haphazardly stored novels and arrange them on the particle board shelf. The bottom shelves were full, and I was just beginning to load up the top shelf with the last of my New York Times bestsellers, when I noticed something was sitting behind the lip of the bookshelf. I reached my hand into the corner and pulled out a worn leather book. There were no markings on the front or back to identify what it was or who it may have belonged to. Thumbing it open to a page marked with an attached leather strip bookmark, I could see the winding loops of cursive handwriting. Not a book so to speak, but a journal. It must have belonged to the ranger who manned the station before me. Momentarily, I considered reading it, but decided against it. Tossing it on top of the bookshelf, I made a mental note to give it to Mr. Garland the next time I saw him, so he could return it to the rightful owner. After stowing away my books, I took the cardboard box outside and started walking down the gravel path to the storage building. There was a steel cage to place garbage inside of to try and keep larger wildlife from rifling through the garbage. I reached down to my hip to retrieve my jingling set of keys to unlock the disposal gate. Setting the box down, I slid the key into the lock and opened the gate to toss it in. But just as I reached down to retrieve the box, I could hear something off in the distance. By now, the light of day was a distant memory and my eyes had not yet adjusted to the darkness. Years of living in the city had made me forget just how dark the forest could be. I had still gone on the occasional hike or camping trip with classmates, but it had usually been to a uh, pay-to-stay campsite with bathroom-shower combinations and paths lit with soft wattage bulbs. It hadn't occurred to me to switch on the light that extended to the storage shed. My visibility was aided only by the light bulb on the cabin's front porch, which was being swallowed up by the walls of darkness. That's when I heard the whistling. It was soft and indistinct, but I could hear it nonetheless. The crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs in the distance accompanied the unidentifiable tune. I was unable to move as I attempted to locate the direction it was coming from, but my efforts were fruitless. While the sound seemed to be coming from one point far off in the distance, I could also hear traces of it all around me, as though the owner of the notes had placed a surround sound system in the trees. Before Thomas had left, we had gone over the camping permit logs for our grid, and there were none requested within ten miles of my post. All of the most popular hiking trails were equally far away, so there was little to no reason for anyone to be traveling in this area at this time of night. The only trails around here were less traveled and given to more experienced hikers. Any hiker with the skill to travel these trails would also have the common sense to have set up camp for the night. As I stood listening and squinting in the darkness, I couldn't help but feel like the ten-year-old boy from so many years ago, but this time I didn't have my father to comfort me. That night around the fire he was able to explain all of this in a way that made me believe my imagination had just run away with me. Standing here by myself, I felt none of that certainty. The whistling was becoming louder and more distinct. Where before, it was a disembodied and distant sound, I could tell that the source was now moving in my direction. There was a haunting yet beautiful melody that I was now able to hear more clearly. I could also hear the more defined noise of crunching leaves and snapping twigs. It was almost hypnotizing, 
My eyes began to close, and relaxation began to settle into my bones, where icy fear had been only moments earlier. I felt like it may be a good idea to just walk toward the source of the beautiful melody. It's... this way, I heard a soft voice say. Come and see. The feeling of relaxation drained out of me almost as quickly as it had begun. Where the melodic whistling had lulled me into a stupor, the sudden call from the darkness sobered me to the situation. I stumbled backward toward the cabin and began to run toward the safety of the burning bulb. The sounds of my heavy footfalls as I ran ensured that any whistling or footsteps would be out of my ability to hear. All the while, though, I could imagine someone, or something mere steps behind me, a hand of claw outstretched toward my back, and still beckoning me to come and see whatever was in the darkness of the forest. Once I reached the front door, I pushed my way inside, slammed the door, engaged the deadbolt, and slid onto the floor. My back against the door, I simply sat there panting and trying to listen for any signs of activity outside. There was no whistling, no footsteps on the walkway or the porch, no knocking. It was just the noise of my gulping breath and the thunder of my heart against my ribcage. After a few minutes, I was finally able to collect myself enough to put a plan together. If there was someone out there, maybe they were in danger. If they weren't, they had no business on Ranger property in the middle of the night. I went to the control room in the cabin and threw on the breakers to the floodlights located around the perimeter of the cabin, fire tower, and storage building. Through the blinds of the cabin, I could see the piercing beams of artificial light. Before leaving the control room, I grabbed a floodlight and grabbed a hunting rifle off of the rack. Uneasily and slowly, I disengaged the deadbolt to the front door and stepped outside. The forest was now a terrifying combination of artificial light and obscenely long shadows created by the floodlights on the trees. I made my way back down the gravel trail toward the storage building behind the cabin. The whistling had begun just beyond the storage shed. Once by the shed, I turned on the handheld floodlight and began to sweep the tree line looking for anyone or anything that may have hung around. Nothing. Not a single damn thing. For all of the crunching leaves and breaking branches, I thought I had heard there was no sign that anything had moved through the area recently, at least nothing larger than a squirrel. I continued sweeping the distance with the floor light when I could hear the ping of an incoming call on the fire tower watch radio. The sound made me jump, and I was instantly relieved to realize it was an incoming radio signal, and that no one was here to watch my grown self leap in terror. Already out of breath from running from the storage building and my brief control, the ascent to the top of the tower was painfully slow. I finally reached the lookout box and turned on the light. Tower 1, this is Tower 5. Do you copy? I punched the button on the radio mic. I read you, Tower 5. Go for Tower 1. Tower 1, status check. The voice said, I can see your floods over here at Tower 5. Everything okay? I immediately felt embarrassed and didn't want to explain this to my co-worker who I hadn't even met yet. Everything is all clear, I responded. I just... Thomas explained how to use the flood system, but I wanted to give it a hands. On run, I'll cut them now. Everything is 10-4, Tower 5 radioed back that they understood and wished me luck. I thanked the ranger and headed back down to the cabin to the control room to cut the flood system off. Reaching for the controls, I hesitated before cutting the system off. As scared and tired as I was, I knew I had to take one last look outside before I shut the floods off. Pulling the cord on the blinds, I opened them to look outside. In the distance at the edge of the floodlights, I thought I could see something roughly the size of a human walking into the darkness of the wood line. My heart began to hammer all over again. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and tried to snap a picture before it disappeared, but it was gone before I managed to open up the application. Before I returned my phone to my phone to my pocket, a curious thought occurred to me. Thumbing through my applications, I finally found the one I was looking for. A digital compass popped up on my screen, and the knee bounced side to side as my hand shook. Once I was able to settle my nerves, the needle finally came to rest. It pointed to the north, part four. To say I was on edge for the next few days would have been an understatement. The remainder of the week was my last week on the day shift before I transitioned to my two-week rotation of evening watch. While I hadn't seen anything alarming since the night Thomas had departed, I had also taken special care to avoid the opportunity. 
No more nighttime travel to the storage shed. No taking the trash out in the evening. If I needed to complete any outdoor tasks, I made sure to take care of them during sundown. I had mostly convinced myself that it was all in my imagination, but the thought still rolled around in the back of my head that maybe I saw and heard exactly what I thought I had. Immediately after my shift each day, I shut down all lookout equipment except the radio and headed directly down to the cabin. My evenings consisted of a steady schedule of TV show binging, dinner, a shower, and reading in bed. The small supply of paperback books I had brought didn't provide as much entertainment as I had hoped. Most of them I had already read dozens of times, and I quickly thumbed through the few that hadn't lost all of their appeal. The paperback I was currently trying to delve into had lost most of its luster, and I put it aside on the nightstand and gazed at the bookshelf to see if something caught my eye. That's when I saw the journal. Shuffling out of bed and to the bookshelf, I scooped up the journal and returned to the bed. Initially, I had told myself it was immoral to read someone's private journal, but the odd feeling this place gave me and the lack of other engaging activities made it easier than it should have to justify reading just a few pages. Settling back in under the blankets, I flipped open the cover to the first page and ran my hand over the indentions of the cursive writing on the page. Although I had told myself I would only read a few pages that turned into about a quarter of the journal, the beginning introduced me to its writer, Gary Vincent, and his arrival to this cabin. Entry one was dated for roughly two years before I arrived and told the uneventful story of his early life, education, and acceptance of the ranger position at Fire Tower, one in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Our stories were fairly similar in many respects, but Gary seemed to have skipped the period of self-loathing and desperation before his employment here. While not the most energetic or entertaining read I had ever come across, there was something enjoyable about learning the personal thoughts and feelings of who I assumed was my predecessor. Thomas had trained him as well, and the two of them seemed to have developed a good friendship if Gary's words were to be believed. The two of them camped and hiked and hiked the area together, and enjoyed their shared time at the cabin when Thomas came to relieve Gary for his R&R days. I was beginning to nod in and out of alertness when I had finished about a third of the journal, when an entry jolted me back to attention. The date redacted, so there seems to be something weird going on around here. I love everything about living and working here in the forest, but now and again I just get that feeling something is watching me from the forest. Can't quite put my finger on why brings the sensation about, but it's the same feeling you get when someone stands behind you in a room but doesn't say anything. Just an electric charge sensation. Last night I was hauling the kitchen trash out to the good old dumpster dungeon when I started hearing someone whistling out in the woods. I always check the camping permits at the start and end of my shift so if there is an emergency I can get help out to them. The thing is, there are no permits out this far that we had on record today. I tried calling out to the person whistling, but they would just fall silent whenever I did. A few minutes later the little tune would pick back up. I'd try calling out again, but it was just the same. No more whistling for a minute. There was a time or two I thought someone was telling me to come and look at something, but I'm not sure. I headed into the control room and grabbed a flashlight to search the area, but after a half hour or so of stumbling around in the woods, I called it quits. Didn't see anyone or hear any more whistling. Haven't really been out here all that long, but maybe the lack of daily interaction with people is just making my mind funny. Don't know, but not too worried about it. If whistling is the worst thing I hear, I think I'm in pretty good shape. I read the passage over and over again. Almost the same thing had happened to Gary. The only noticeable difference between the two events was my total panic compared to Gary's cool and collected approach to investigating the area. I know that he had not experienced the same event as a child that I had, but it was almost impossible to believe that this wouldn't have seemed kind of strange to him. A second difference dawned on me. Gary hadn't seen anyone in the woodline. I wasn't positive that I saw a person, but I was certain I had seen something. Too engaged with the similarities of the journal, I knew I would be up for the rest of the night until I finished it. I got out of bed again and headed into the kitchen to make myself a pot of coffee. After the ancient machine spilled the last drop into the pot, I poured a mug full and settled into the kitchen table to continue my reading. 
The pages immediately following the whistling event were more of the same day-in-day-out stream of thought journal entries you would expect until about three months later. With date redacted, this place is starting to mess with my mind a little bit. I was outside last night doing my usual dumpster run when I started hearing that damn whistling again. Honestly, I'd forgotten about the last time it happened until ten or so last night. Tossed the trash in the cage when the whistling started up. The flashlight was already in my pocket this time. Started carrying it a few weeks ago just as a precaution. I could hear the whistling louder this time, and something about it just made me happy. Just felt like I could wander in that direction and listen to it a little closer if I could find who was making that beautiful noise. Kind of made me sad, too, though. Not sure why. I filled on the flashlight and started walking north into the woods to see if I could find who it was. I called out and asked who was there and the whistling again. This time someone shouted back, It's this way! Come and see! I asked them what it was, but no one answered. When I started walking toward the sound of the voice, I could hear footsteps and whistling walking away from me, so I called out again for them to wait so I could talk to them. They just repeated the same thing. It's this way. Come and see. By now I figured there must be something to check out, so I kept walking after them. Maybe someone was hurt. The melody of that whistling made the traveling feel a little bit easier, though. I felt kinda happy, like something good was going to happen. The woods were starting to get thicker by now, and I wasn't gaining on them. They always seemed to be just the same distance in front of me. They had been the entire time. Occasionally, I would catch a glimpse of someone in my flashlight beam, and I'd call out, but still the same old thing. It's this way. Come and see. Eventually, I came to a cluster of oak trees that were so tightly packed together, it looked like one monstrous tree. When I got to it, the whistling stopped for a little while, and suddenly, I felt sad and alone. My eyes teared up, and I wasn't sure why. Then the whistling tune came back like it sensed that I needed it again to be happy. It sounded like it was up in the top of the trees. I tried shouting for them again a few times, but no one answered at first. After a few minutes of trying to get their attention, I finally heard someone reply, It's up here. Come see. Up where? I asked the voice. In the trees. Just use the stairs, the voice called back. I ran the flashlight around the base of the bunch of trees, and in the center of them, I could see what looked like a step. Inching closer and leaning between two of the oaks, I could see a damn spiral staircase running up the center of the trees and into the foliage. For a moment, it felt like the right thing to do. Just grab onto the banister and climb up to the top. My foot was just settling onto the bottom step when a sudden beeping and vibration startled me back to my senses. My smartwatch was beeping loudly, and when I looked down at it, my heart rate was nearly 150 beats a minute. I saw the time, too. It had only been ten o'clock when I headed out to take the trash out, but it was almost eleven-thirty now. Seemed like I had only been in the woods for maybe fifteen minutes, but it had been an hour and a half. I panicked and headed back in the direction of the cabin. As I made my way back, there was the remnant of an old hiking trail that took me within a stone's throw of the cabin. It took me almost two hours to get back. My body aches and I feel like I have the flu. I'm not sure what the hell that was out there, but I'm going to have to call this in at the start of my shift. My heart raced as I continued to read the journal. On the next few pages, Gary recounted how he had called in the staircase to Superintendent Garland the next day, and that a team of rangers had met him at the cabin. They traveled back to the location where Gary had seen the stairs, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Gary begged them to come back at night, because maybe it would be visible to them then. The other rangers agreed to this to help calm Gary's concerns, but when they arrived there later that evening, the cops of trees still didn't hold the staircase. The journal entries front his point became almost incoherent in their format. Gary was fixated on how the stairs had disappeared and why they couldn't find them. He admitted to traveling back multiple times, but never seeing them again. The absence of the whistling from unseen entities also seemed to bother him rather than soothe his concerns. He wrote endlessly about missing the beautiful melody and that it maddened him that he couldn't remember all of the notes. Then there were no entries for a long time. When Gary wrote what would be his final entry in the journal, he seemed to be a man who had lost grips on reality. The music didn't return to me. I had been so sad without it. The gentle melody haunted my mind, 
even though I couldn't quite remember how it sounded. So I traveled back again, down the forgotten path. I traveled north, traveled to that unusual copse of trees, and there it was. The stairs were there. Thank God! They were there. No one was whistling and no voice invited me up, but I knew that I needed to go. I belonged there. With them, he was waiting for me. With them, he was waiting for me. The banister felt so good under my hand as I made my way up. Into the foliage. Through the foliage. Into my new home. Everyone is in unison there. The many are one. I came back here to say goodbye to. Someone. Was someone here I knew? I'll just say goodbye to you, journal. I am going back. I know I will stay. I want to be in unison. Maybe I can help others find their way there. I hope he will let me help. So many souls can be won if they will let themselves go. To anyone who reads these words, I tell you true. It is this way. Come and see. That was it. Nothing but blank pages followed this final entry. I was shaking as I closed the leather cover and stared into my empty coffee cup. The sun was creeping over the tops of the trees now, and I knew that if I didn't move soon, I would be late for the start of my shift. I put on a fresh pot of coffee and began to ready myself for my shift in a daze. The journal stayed clutched in my hand as though it were some talisman that may protect me from Gary's fate. I didn't know exactly what to do in the long run, but for now, I knew I had to get to my post. Basically, Park Ranger helped us deal with the supernatural. In late fall of 2015, me and my family decided to go to Gettysburg for vacation. Being a big history lover, I was stoked to see the battlefield. The weather was amazing, and the atmosphere was somber and peaceful. The first day was mostly spent at the museum and walking parts of the battlefield. Nothing really happened until we were getting ready for bed in the hotel room. My brother sat up suddenly in bed and ran to the door, opening it and stepping into the hallway. We asked him if he was okay, and he asked us if we had heard men yelling orders and cannon fire. We had four people in the room, and no one else heard anything. The next day, while we were on the battlefield near Devil's Dean, it felt as if someone was constantly following behind us, even though no one was there. That second night, as we got ready for bed, there was cannon fire, and this time... We all heard it, including some of the other guests, who came out into the hallway. The third day, we were at Little Round Top, and I decided to crawl between some rocks to get a perspective of what the sharpshooters would have seen. While laying on my stomach, I felt someone lay a hand on my shoulder and whisper in my ear, I see him... At first, I thought it was my brother, until I heard him call my name from the statue that sits off to the side... It was so odd after that I kept feeling as if I was about to turn around and bump into someone. It got to the point I turned around and I felt extremely cold, as if I had walked into a freezer. My mother, who was beside me, also noticed the temperature difference and commented how odd it was. Later that evening, about an hour before the sun went down, me and my mom took the car to see a couple more things and take some pictures. We were at the high water mark, taking pictures and thinking about what could have been going through those poor men's thoughts. It brought tears to our eyes, and we both heard a man say, Don't cry for me, lass. The atmosphere shifted, and it felt extremely peaceful and relaxing. It was as if whoever it was was trying to comfort us. We both sat there for a while until it was time to go. As we walked back to where we parked the car, there was a couple sitting beside their car. They said hello, and we had a small conversation, and in mid-conversation we all stopped talking. From the battlefield we all heard fifes and drums. The couple seemed unnerved, and they got up, said goodbye, and got into their car. We decided that it was time to leave since it was almost dark, and no one should be on the battlefield at night. Our last day there we toured Eisenhower's home, and then toured Big Round Top. Eventually, my brother and father wanted to go back to the hotel, so we took them back. We decided to go back to Big Round Top, seeing as it was our last day to explore. We parked the car and walked into the forest. We had about two hours before the sun set, and no one was around. About twenty minutes into the hike, my mom stopped, and I was about to ask what was wrong when I heard footsteps. There were multiple footsteps that we could hear, and they stopped. Then, when we would start walking again, the footsteps would start up again. At one point, we decided to turn back, and my mother needed a rest, so we sat on a boulder. 
it suddenly got quiet to the point there were no crickets, birds, or any other forest sounds. Then all at once we heard horses snorting and trotting, galloping past us. Then it full-on sounded like we were in the middle of a battle. Bugles sounding, clashing of swords, muskets firing, and lots of men yelling. We were in complete shock, and it lasted for a couple minutes. Then it all stopped. We started talking about what we had just witnessed, and then we heard several men calling out, Help! Help! You are the one to die! And crying. It was so overwhelming that we booked it back to where we parked the car, and when we got to the car, a park ranger was there. He took one look at us and asked, What did you all see or hear? We explained what had happened, and he told us that he had stopped a man he thought was a Union soldier reenactor. He had told him he wasn't allowed on the battlefield after dark. He said the man smiled and with a shrug carried on. He said he was about to stop him again when the soldier walked through a tree and disappeared. We went back to the hotel, and the next morning, as we were eating our breakfast in the dining area, before checkout me, my mother and brother heard a bugle playing, but no one else in the dining area seemed to hear it. It was all a bunch of strange events, but we did go back, and we had even more experiences the second time. We have several pictures where you can clearly see soldiers on horseback and soldiers around the different spots on the battlefields. I may upload pictures if I can. If you get a chance, it is a great place for history and the paranormal. I grew up outside of a relatively small town in Texas and, more importantly, in a haunted house. Well, to be more accurate, on haunted land. And I'd like to tell a few stories, as well as my own experiences. Now, a little background which gives some context to why I say land instead of just houses. My childhood home sat about 100 yards or a football field off of the Colorado River, on about 100 acres of land technically owned by the city. The public city park that lays outside of the boundaries of the city, yeah, it's that kind of ass. Backwards place, notwithstanding all the other political bullshit you'd expect out of a small southern town. Anyway, back to the actually important information. My father is the live in park ranger for this city. It's not a bad gig, all things considered, though in my opinion he could be paid more for being maintenance and authority figure that's on call 24 hours a day, 365 a year. This means if someone gets locked out, if a camping site loses power or has problems, or there is a conflict, someone is knocking at our door no matter the hour. It's always been this way since I was about seven years old and I'm now 29. He's a tough old man, almost 55 years old, and not all that inclined to share spooky stories of things he's seen and been told, though he does believe in ghosts. He'll try and find the rational explanation for why things happen before he caves and admits it was a ghost, even if my and my mother know damn well what it is. Now, I give this background because it's important to note that when things go wrong, he's usually the first person on the scene. This includes the time we had some jet. Skis explode while a father-daughter were riding them, and they were fine, thank goodness. Alligators roll up on a campsite. Personal disagreements, people trying to be sneaky and not pay by showing up after dark, people doing illegal substances or trying to get freaky in the back seat in the rough camping part of the park, and, of course, being right on the river. Drownings. For some reason, people love to drink and swim, and someone drowns about every three years minimum. We're actually due for another drowning. Following the pattern, I don't hope people drown, but the memory of the last ones don't seem to stick as long as they should. Anyway, Dad is usually the first on the scene either to try and help the people or to direct the ambulance and police, and eventually the search for the bodies. Most appear after a day. One took three days, and Mom said that's the only time she's seen Dad truly disturbed. It's not a fun part of the job, and Dad dreads summer and spring when people start coming out and acting stupid. Please, please, do not drink and swim, and if your kid isn't a strong swimmer, even if they are, please put a flotation of some kind on them if you're swimming in a river or lake, for your sake and everyone else's. So, people drown, sad as it is. That being said, these drownings have led to several spirits that hang around. Our most popular one to be reported is the first man my father helped try and find the body for. 
He was wearing a white shirt, blue jeans, and was a friendly man by nature. Now I need you to know, I have only seen him once myself after his passing. My mother and my father have both seen him multiple times, and many campers have seen him. One gentleman who likes to fish was out late, close to midnight, returned to his car. Alone as he'd been all day, he gets his gear in, gets in himself, and goes to buckle up after starting his car, only to see the smiling figure of the man in the white shirt and jeans in the passenger seat. He leapt out, and when he turned around, saw no one in his car. It's been almost five years, and this fisher no longer comes out by himself if he's staying after dark. Other campers have reported seeing a man sitting at a table, white shirt and jeans, who will see them and raise his hand as if to wave at them. People will go to wave back onto to realize no one is there. My mother used to work early morning shifts, 3 a.m. to 2 p.m., and she'd see him standing outside of the office on her way to work from time to time. My own experience with him is simple but spooky. I was sitting in the office with a friend one night talking. About 10.30, my parents now live above the office after Hurricane Harvey. Anyway, we were sitting there, and I see out the window over my friend's shoulder, a figure walk by the window like it was going to walk through the double glass doors of the office. Now I live in a park, meant for camping and visiting. However, it's important to note that the park was a closed due to our sewer system getting redone and B. It was the middle of the week and most people don't show up then. It was the man in the white shirt and jeans and I knew that he was coming to buy something from the office. I was spooked. Who wouldn't be? And my friend and I retreated upstairs rapidly. He's never been threatening and I'm sort of glad the flood didn't take him away. However, even with him on the land, there are worse things that are here. My childhood home, which, I must admit, I'm sort of still grieving and grateful I cannot live in again, was destroyed in Hurricane Harvey. It had two feet of water in it and emotionally devastated our family. There is something that still lives in that husk now used for storage, and I hate it. Growing up, my bedroom was used during the day by myself and never at night. When I was little, I often had night terrors that had me shrieking for my mother, and sleeping on the couch instead. She told me that I often said she has no face when I was asked why I was crying at night. By time I was nine, the couch in the living room was my bed and my bedroom help a cheap futon. The feeling of being watched, of something standing behind you, was and is overwhelming. I hated it. Even when I slept in the living room, I had to have the door to that room shut, as well as the one next to it. The feeling of being stared at was so strong. We had a door to the garage at one end of the living room and one doorway to the kitchen. The garage door was open during the day and there was no tangible door to the kitchen. What I saw in these parts of the house I can't say were human-like, but they at least wanted to be seen as it. They felt wrong, very wrong. Have you ever seen someone walk quickly by an open doorway? My mother and I, and we think my father, but he'll deny it saw these tall figures blur by mostly dark but occasionally pale. I hated seeing them. I always had this awful sense of dread and anxiety, a fear they'd not walk by the doorway but walk into the room I was in. I think they did, more than once. I think they did, more than once. I used to walk in circles in our living room while on the phone with my now platonic partner. As I'd walk by the couch... I'd feel as if something brushed against or wrapped around my ankle, and it always terrified me. I was always scared to look behind me or under the couch. As a grown woman of twenty-something, it hated those things, those moments. They liked to touch my hair and ankles as I tried to sleep, and I'd say it might have been sleep paralysis, except it was only ever after I closed my eyes initially, and falling asleep was an hour's. Long trial. Mom often experienced seeing them and hates them, too. Since Dad is on call 24-7, there are times he has to go out at night, much to our anxiety. We'd often hear the front door open and shut, or hear his voice and call out to see what had happened or what was wrong. About half the time, he wasn't even home, and for a time, we'd write it off that we'd just heard things until the dogs started responding to it, too. We used to have a lab mastiff mix who would grow any time this happened and move closer to my mom like he was defending her. I've seen things dart under curtains or beneath sinks, found drawers open and things knocked over and open that had screw, 
on tops or push, in tops that no one had touched in months. One time a mounted deer, head from my grandfather, came off its hook and cracked me in the head. The nail it was on is unbent and undamaged, but it hurt, I assure you. Anyway, more recently during my current visit home, Mom says that when she goes over to the house, or what used to be our house, she doesn't like going inside anymore. She says that when she takes the dogs out at night for bathroom breaks, she doesn't look in the dark windows. The house and my childhood home share a massive yard, even if her instincts are telling her to. She's scared that if she does something will be looking back at her, or feels like something is looking back at her when she does. I have these same feelings, and sometimes when I'm on doggy duty, the feeling that something is peeking over the seven-foot fence. This post is long, but I'd like to finish it by saying that our new home above the office is much more peaceful. Something opened the locked bathroom door the other night while I was visiting my parents, and an entire shelf popped off, its rack in the cabinets a few weeks before that. Strange things still happen, but I'll be honest to say that I'm glad it's nothing like at the old home. These aren't the only moments I've had, which range from hearing muffled conversations for hours in the childhood home, in the dead of night, when everyone was asleep, to hearing it again at my friend's house for months and months and months. I've also experienced things at the high school where I teach, so I'm not sure if it's me or my life, but I'll never be persuaded the supernatural isn't real. I worked as a forest ranger during my college summers, several years before stories of things like skinwalkers became culturally commonplace, certainly before I'd heard of them, and one year we had a night hike activity with story stations. My station had me by myself up on a cliff that overlooked the river, and about halfway through the hike, I was generally the furthest from the other staff at any given time, but because I was in charge of the nature programs, I knew those woods like the back of my hand. I wasn't frightened in the least. Unless there was recent rain, I could usually get to and from my station without a light. There was another activity where the kids would lead me blindfolded somewhere, and I would lead them back still blindfolded. I knew those woods, and those trails. The program staff storytellers would get a notice to turn off our radios before the first group started the trail. After that, it was dead silence in the dark woods until the first group got there. Since I was fairly far through, it would usually be 15, 20 minutes before the first group of kids came through. One night, I'm up there waiting, this steep cliff about two feet behind where I was sitting, and I hear this kid's voice from what sounded like about ten feet behind me saying my name clear as day. Now, it might not seem all that strange to hear a kid say your name at a camp, even when you think you're alone, but it's important to note here that we used nicknames for safety reasons. And there was not a single child on the 200-acre camp property who actually knew my first name. The staff did, but they were all at least 50 yards away, and this was very much a child's voice. It was also coming from what should have been mid-air, Scared me so bad I had to leave my station and set up closer to the next one so I could at least talk to her in the darkness. Over the course of the summer, almost all of the program staff had similar experiences on those night hikes, until we finally scrapped the activity because nobody wanted to be out in the woods alone without radios anymore. We were going on a patrol. As a park rangers, this was our job. So there's this spooky abandoned train tunnel in my state where a bunch of people died 100 years ago, so now it's haunted allegedly. I brought a colleague with me on the patrol since it was a long one. The area and scenery were beautiful, but the tunnel itself was something else. My buddy, let's just call him Ed, was a bit more nervous than me and didn't want to go too far in. I wanted to go too far in. I wanted to go as far as I could, which turned out not to be far because the tunnel was blocked by impassable debris. But... wait! There was a small hole on the side of the debris mound, and it turns out I could crawl through. So I asked, Hey Ed, you feel like crawling? Nah, dude, no thanks. So I took off my pack and coat and squirmed through. On the other side was the rest of the tunnel, but with water that went up to nearly the top of the mound on the other side, as far as the eye can see. Dang! I would have to swim in ice-cold, nasty water for who knows how long to keep exploring. Nah, 
So I decided to crawl back. My buddy Ed was nervous, but we weren't done yet. Next, we busted out just one tool for detecting ghosts. M. Frieder, as someone who was pretty scientific, I tested it multiple times and made sure it was working before bringing it. We decided to try and contact ghosts in the tunnel. I was pretty confident nothing would happen. We turned off all our electronics and lights so it was pitch black with just the M. Frieder on. I asked pretty basic questions to the ghost, asked it to come in front of my scanner so I'd know it was there, etc. We did this for a while. Nada, no reading, no surprise. So we headed back, decided to keep my M. Frieder on. And then, as we were walking back, suddenly it goes to two lights. Thought maybe our flashlights were causing it, so we turned them off. Nope, still two lights. Reset the device. Two solid lights. And I think something's here, dude. My adrenaline started flowing into my body now, yet I was still skeptical. I started asking it questions again, and then my MF signal got even stronger, and we both were getting chills and the hairs on our skin were standing up. Around this time we heard something, kind of sounded like a distant cough, but it was so fast it was easy to dismiss. I reset the device again, still getting a strong signal from something, and it's not coming from us. I then said, is it all right if we stay in the tunnel with you a bit longer? Meter instantly went back to zero. Surprised, but confident now, I asked, do you want us to leave? Then it instantly went back up to high. Okay, I was pretty convinced at this point. We headed for the entrance to the tunnel and discussed our experience. However, when we were at the entrance, we noticed that the emp was picking up another signal just above and to the side of us now. But if you pointed it in a different direction. There was nothing. We left after that, but we think the ghost may have been hanging out by the entrance waiting for us to leave. You could always say that the MFF was faulty, or picking up something else, but I'm sure that device was working. I tested it so many times before and after, and there was nothing on us producing M. Also, considering that we didn't get any reading in there for the vast majority of the time we were there, Truly mind-boggling, still processing it. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot doing my routine patrol on this night. It all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before which meant it was exceptionally dark outside. Although I was already used to this, the moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by. And somewhere out of nowhere, maybe about thirty minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path, and then crossing in front of me, as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left. Palmettos, actually. This is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything, even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing, whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me, and took me off guard, considering... It didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall, and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared. Deep in the palmettos, my heart sunk, and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I can think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I consider the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack although I wasn't going to back down without a fight. I began getting angry, maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift, ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. 
If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now more than ever, getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue. Remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there was nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. That would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful. Unfortunately, after this not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again. And as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot, native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not. But that didn't matter, regardless of what it actually is. I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me. Or so I had convinced myself, and still wonder. My friend Samantha and I were so excited to take a road trip together to go hiking somewhere further from home. We'd been talking about it since we graduated college a few years back and finally found the time. Well, she always made the time. It was mainly me that had trouble balancing work with anything else. Looking back now, I wish I had spent more of this trip focusing on Sam, the scenery, and being present in the moment. I wish I had been a better friend. Sam was the most excited for our trip. The week before we left, she was texting me about restaurants in the area, stuff to do. She made a Spotify playlist with both of our favorites so we could listen to seven hours worth of an eclectic mix of classic rock, pop, and black metal and was marking. Trailheads. We might enjoy on her Google Maps app. I felt bad for putting the trip off for so long. We gotta catch up, explore, try cool food. We had a great trip up until our final hike. We were both in decent shape, and since we had the supplies and plenty of daylight, we decided we were going to try a longer, unpaved trail that went around this beautiful lake. It was the last hike of our trip, and we decided to take a more difficult and less crowded trail. Initially, it was a wonderful hike. The water was such a surreal shade of blue, and the pine trees and rolling hills were breathtaking. The air was thinner than we were used to, but so refreshing. As we hiked around one bend, I almost ran right into Sam's back. I had been falling behind, focusing on placing my feet in exactly the right locations in the soft dirt so I didn't go sliding down twenty feet to the shore. Sam stood frozen, a deer in front of her blocking the trail. As I approached with my backpack jingling and breathing heavily, the deer stood for a moment more, tilting its head sideways at me before darting back into the pines. She looked back at me, her face tight. Did you see that? The deer? Yeah, it was pretty magical. She gave a little laugh as she started up again, so we could both move on to the section of the trail that had sturdier footing. No, I mean, something was wrong with that deer. It was way too comfortable around me, and I don't know if you could see or hear it, but it was drooling and making these weird sounds. We continued on in silence after that as we focused on our footing and the scenery, stopping every so often to take pictures. One time, when we were stopped, we heard rustling to our right, higher up on the hill. I got the bear spray out and held on to it. It seemed to be walking parallel to us roughly matching our pace. It sounded big, too. Eventually, the hiking trail rose to meet the higher part of the hill, and I couldn't help but sigh in relief. I'd been so worried I'd roll my ankle and tumble down the mountain, so it was good to have more room, so I wasn't walking right on the edge. Back in college, I'd sprained my ankle badly, but couldn't afford to see a doctor. It healed a bit oddly, and since then my left ankle has been iffy. After a while, I needed to sit for a moment. Walking uphill for an hour, in addition to the 6,500-foot elevation, I was struggling, Maybe I am also a bit more out of shape than I had been willing to admit, too. Sam sat with me for a moment, but then saw some wildflowers about ten feet into the woods, and left to go take a quick picture. With her gone, I felt a sudden chill. 
Something was watching me. Sam, I called out nervously as the rustling grew louder, and I gripped my container of bear spray tightly. It stepped out of the woods, and it was just a deer. Or, more specifically, it was the deer, the same one that Sam and had encountered. Now that she had pointed it out, I could see what she was saying. The deer had no issues approaching me. It was scrawny, walked slowly, but like it had a bit too much to drink, and it was definitely drooling. I jumped up and waved my arms at it go away. I knew it was sick and the poor thing was confused, and probably suffering, but it creeped me the hell out. It cocked its head and seemed to be studying me, looking me up and down. It approached me and made some sort of gasping sound. It was opening and closing its mouth in a way which deeply unsettled me for some reason. Sam! She came running towards me from the woods, and when I turned back, it had gone. Are you okay? What happened? The creepy deer was back. I know it sounds silly, but think it's been following us. I told her how it had been behaving. Do you think it's rabid? Poor baby, she said sympathetically. Possibly. Or I wonder if it has cued. Either way, we should probably let the park rangers know just in case. We had decided we'd stick together, but after a few miles, she ended up ahead of me again. She tends to inch forward to get pictures, whereas I tend to walk past sights, then have regrets and double back to take pictures. I had walked back a bit and was sitting down, angling my phone weirdly to try and fit the scene in front of me in the frame when I heard Sam's voice, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. Hey, I'll be right there, I said, my voice raised slightly. Assuming she was talking to me then, she screamed. Sam, I stood up and tried to walk as quickly and carefully as possible. Her screaming changed from fear to agony, and it sounded like she was sobbing. I wasn't sure what happened, but I could tell she was scared and likely hurt. I suddenly realized I was still holding our only canister of bear spray. Against my better judgment, I started running as fast as I could, and for a while I was making good time. But then my left foot landed a patch of soft dirt at the edge of the trail. My ankle rolled and I was falling. I don't remember hitting the ground, but I remember opening my eyes flat on my back about fifteen feet below where I had been standing. It was also dark outside. We'd started hiking at least six, seven hours before sunset. I tried to stand, but it was a struggle. I was confused, disoriented. Trying to get up was talking all my energy and focus. I had a deep feeling of dread I couldn't explain. As I started slowly moving upwards on my hands and knees, I tried to recall what had happened leading up to my fall. Sam sounded hurt. She was screaming. I had run after her and then I fell. Shit, Sam! I called her name, my voice hoarse, but no response. My phone was surprisingly only minorly damaged, but I had no reception. Luckily, since it had been buckled to me, I still had our backpack. I dug through it. We had first aid kits, but I figured I could patch myself up later. I didn't want to stay down here any longer than I had to. I found my knife and my headlamp. After about twenty minutes, I had slowly and painfully ascended back towards where I had fallen from. My hands were raw, and I could feel my right knee bleeding through my pants. I was trying to go slowly since I trusted my feet even less now, and dizziness was starting to creep in, but panic and fear drove me forward. Once I made it back to the trail, I had to sit for a moment. I heard rustling behind me and felt a sudden pang of fear. Something or... Someone had injured Sam, and here I was, sitting alone, injured, with my back to the woods, in the dark. I tried calling her name in case it was her that I heard. No response. I stood up and started limping as quickly as possible towards the direction that I had last heard her scream. Luckily, the ground had evened out, because I could feel myself weaving unsteadily. I knew that something terrible may have happened to her, but kept trying to keep that thought out of my mind. As my calls to her remained unanswered and it became harder to imagine a scenario in which she was okay, I felt my throat tighten and tears roll down my cheeks. I kept looking for her. I knew she wouldn't just leave me here. I think part of me knew then that she was gone. She would have been searching for me if she was okay, and even if she left to get help, I think they would have found me by then. Somehow, eventually, I navigated my way to where I thought she had last been. I was hoping maybe if she was injured, 
She was okay and just out of it, and confused like I was. My foot caught in the mud, and I fell. Lights flashed behind my eyelids, and I felt overcome with nausea. The light from my headlamp had greatly dimmed, as it was now coated in mud and grime. I heard movement behind me as the smell hit me. I realized the mud was dirt mixed with blood. I could taste it mixed with the gritty texture, leaves covered with what was likely blood stuck to my face, and I felt something soft and wet under my shoulder. The rustling behind me became discernible as footsteps. I felt around for my knife, my bare spray, but instead felt something hard, sticky. I was certain I had just found out what happened to Sam and had a good guess at what was about to happen next to me. I felt no urge to get up as the footsteps got closer. I knew I couldn't outrun it. I closed my eyes trying to focus on something, anything else, not knowing if I wanted to see what was coming for me. The footsteps stopped, and I could hear labored breathing coming from above me. I waited, and then, as no blows came, I opened my eyes. It was Sam. She stood over me, breathing heavily from her mouth. She was covered in blood. Her shirt and pants were torn, but she was alive. I let out a relieved sob and then could no longer hold back the tears. Oh my God, I whispered. As I slowly moved to sitting and then standing, I thought I had lost you. I pulled her close to me into a hug. She stood motionless, her arms at her side. She stuck to me where her shirt was still a bit wet. Dried blood covered the neck of her shirt and her midsection. Her hands and unsettlingly, her mouth, were also smeared with blood. I could still hear her breathing heavily close to my ear. What happened? I asked as I released her. She stared at me but didn't respond. I figured she was a bit traumatized. Frankly, I wasn't sure how she was up and standing at all after whatever had happened. She was a bit wobbly, but otherwise seemed to be able to walk. As we walked towards the car, she fell behind me, which made me nervous, as I didn't want to let her out of my sight. She kept stopping, staring over her shoulder, while I tried to coax her forward. Eventually, after what felt like forever, we made it back. My ankle was killing me, but I had tried to move as fast as possible. Although the woods were eerily silent, I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. When we got to her car, I was debating if we should drive ourselves to the hospital or call 911. I had this feeling of terror that I couldn't shake. I pictured us making it all the way here to the car and then something breaking the windows, attacking us. I decided we needed to leave now. Do you have your keys? Do you think you can drive? I asked. She had an old Jeep pickup and was very sensitive about other people driving her baby. Plus, I wasn't sure I could drive us with my ankle as it was. She said nothing, cocked her head at me. I know. We look like we've been mauled by a bear. I caught myself and winced, feeling suddenly insetly insensitive. She clearly had been attacked by something or someone. When she said nothing, displayed no emotion or reaction. I cautiously continued, but I have a bad feeling. I think we need to leave, like right now. I'd rather call for help when we're back on the main road or just drive straight to the hospital. She remained motionless staring back into the woods, and I wondered if she lost her keys in whatever struggle she had. Luckily, I had her spare with me. I unlocked the doors, and she continued to stand outside. I realized I would need to punish my ankle a bit more, because she was far too out of it to drive. I slid in, but she remained motionless. Sam, get in, please. Something is out here still. Please. She was licking her lips, staring back at me again. In the darkness... Her blue eyes looked almost black. I limped back out of the seat and opened her door for her and had to guide her in. I buckled her in after she made no move to do so for herself. As we drove and headlights of passing cars illuminated the interior, I kept checking on her out of the corner of my eye. She was breathing in and out of her mouth and staring at me. I noticed now, in the better light, that she was drooling. Hey! <sighs> oh! How are you doing? No response, but she began opening and closing her mouth and making a wet gasping sound as she breathed in and out. Her breath reeked and her teeth were tinged pink. I don't have much medical knowledge, but I was worried she had a punctured lung due to the strange sounds she was making. Hold tight, we're about twenty minutes from the hospital. Despite my ankle, I drove as fast as I could. We made it in ten. As we pulled up, I helped guide her out of the car and walked behind her steadying her. 
I noticed something. Her shirt was on inside out. It hadn't been this morning, likely because of how we looked. They found rooms for us immediately in the ear. I had a bad sprain and a concussion, and would need a few stitches, but it felt so good just to be out of those woods. I asked the nurse that came to check on me about how Sam was doing. I mentioned to him, I'm not sure if she was attacked by an animal or a person, I mentioned what I had noticed about her shirt, and that we may have encountered a sick animal, in case any of that helped. When he returned, he was clearly distressed. Sam was gone. She hadn't appeared to be outwardly injured, strangely, but they had wanted to assess for internal trauma. However, the first moment they had left her alone, she had just walked out, judging by the bloody footprints. It's been weeks, and I haven't seen Sam since. Her mom hasn't either. She has been working with the police out here. They think Sam has a head wound and is just confused and will turn up in town eventually. But, a few days ago, I heard on the news that a partial skeleton was found on the trail we were on. Likely the victim of an animal attack, they said. And due to the condition of the body, they were asking for leads so they could use dental records to help identify the victim. This might sound crazy, but I think it's her they found. I don't know how to explain it, but I don't think Sam ever left those woods that night. It's my fault, and I don't know what that thing was that I drove into town. If you live in southern Colorado, please be safe. I'm sorry. While I was working as a park ranger in Appalachia, I had my share of creepy encounters. So, I've got two experiences worth sharing. I'll start with the less traumatic of the two. Seven years ago, four of us were on a July patrol trip in the Yosemite National Park. It was day three of week-long patrol trail, and we were stopped to rest at midday before pushing on over the divide and finding a suitable spot to stop for the night. Our resting spot was on the shore of a small lake right around 10,000 feet in elevation. It was nearing Timberline, in the zone where the only trees were low-growing bushes, the shore of the lake was mostly rock shelves, right at the waterline and relatively level. After we shed our packs and got the dogs out of theirs, we stretched out in the sun and just relaxed. While we were laying there, there was a tremendous splash about 30 yards down the shore from us. The kind of splash that would come from a huge rock boulder being hurled into the water. At the concussion, we bolted up and turned around to see what had caused the ruckus. We could see by the disturbance on the surface of the lake where the rock or something had entered the water fifty feet or so from the shore. As I said, the lake shore was level. There were no cliffs of any sort the rock could have fallen from. The only trees were low-growing bushes. As we sat there and regained our composure, we quietly discussed what might be responsible for the commotion. Our theories ranged from Bigfoot to meteors and everything in between. To this day, we still discuss what happened there, and I will occasionally pull up the picture I took of the lakeshore, just to remind myself how weird and unexplainable it was. Like I said, not overly dramatic, but totally weird. I'm a park warden. I spend most of my shifts alone, working 5.30 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. in the Canadian wilderness, we have about 300 campsites, a handful of beaches and the infrastructure that goes with them, showers, etc. It just so happens that my park is closed for the winter, which are standard Canadian, feet upon feet of snow and blistering cold, so there is no staff in the park from mid-October to early April. Years ago, a man decided to end it all via a sawed-off shotgun, down by the river on one of the beaches in late November, and no one found him until the spring melt. This beach is at the farthest north point of the park and is pretty isolated. But as it has a beach, it requires at least one patrol in evening. I was down in the showers at that specific beach around 7 p.m. On a very overcast day, no sun you create shadows. I was checking the supplies in the first aid kits and signing off on fire extinguishers. The weather was blast, so there were no campers out or patrons anywhere near the beach, and the parking lot was empty except for my cruiser. All of a sudden, a feeling of intense panic washed over me, and I booked it to my cruiser. Get in! Slam the door! Take a few deep breaths and wait for the feeling to pass! After a minute or two, I get back to business. 
but this time sitting in my locked car, which is still parked in the same spot, filling out binders and work logs. Suddenly, a huge dark shape moves across my driver's side window, and I screamed and jumped back. My immediate thought was someone had been lurking and was about to try and smack the glass open the door. Sure as shit, it's empty. Not a soul around. You can bet your ass I left any and all future maintenance tasks in that neck of the park to be done by the day shift, floored it out of there with a giant F that, maybe not the scariest or most shocking story that'll be posted, but it rattled me hard and I now refuse to do foot patrols down there at night three years later. I've been a park ranger for 11 years. Not going to say where I work, but it is a very large park. This story took place in spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night. I worked nights most of my career. One day, a member of the public who were camping had called in saying that there were a large group of youths making noise and drinking. I was dispatched, and starting walking over in the dark, I tried to sneak up. This was a breach of my standard operating procedure. To try to apprehend as many as I can, I managed to apprehend four or five, don't clearly remember, and all the others ran into the woods. My prediction was that were as many as twenty people from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out here to take over. Deputies arrived at this point. I was all alone in the middle of nowhere. I radioed through to try to get guided back to the more civilized part of the woods. At this point, I had already walked quite far and radio connection was breaking up. Hmm. We had bad radios back then. As I approached a part of the woods I was familiar with, I looked behind me and saw someone walking up to me very slowly. I then called out, hello, no response. At this point, radio contact was back. I radioed in saying that I have spotted someone. At this point, the figure is maybe 40 meters away. I then called out, stop, and are you okay? No response. As the figure came closer, it just disappeared. I couldn't make out what it was. Next day came in normal day. Mentioned to my friend who had worked here for ten years. I mentioned what happened, and he made a scared face and said it's nothing. Got up and walked away. In 2013, I left work at the sheriff's office. Never mentioned to anyone except some close friends while drunk. I'm Leon, a park ranger in Monongahela National Forest, West Virginia. As I was clearing out some thick underbrush while doing some trailblazing in one of the most remote sections of the forest, I found a canister crudely tied to a harpoon stuck in a tree deep in the woods. There was only a note in the waterproof canister, so there's no telling how long the note and harpoon have been here. All that I can tell is that the harpoon is made of a metal I've never seen before, and it emits a constant, discordant hum. After reading the note, I wanted to transcribe it and post it here for the entire world to see. The implications are staggering, and they're way above my pay grade. It will take me some time to transcribe, so I'll post it in chunks in the meantime. If you're reading this note, I'm sending this warning to anyone that will listen. My name is Elfie, and I was a scavenger during the Great Abyssalian War. I want to recount the horrors, the divine miracles, and the noble sacrifice that I witnessed in the Abyssalian invasion. Since you're reading this note, I'm glad that I was able to successfully breach the boundary between past and present with this sacred harpoon. The harpoon means more than you know. Keep it close at hand for when the Abyssalian arrive. Let me recount the events of the invasion from the beginning. In 2056, billions of lithe, black, mechanical creatures emerged from thousands of dimensional breaches that simultaneously appeared throughout the world. They chittered and hummed as they skittered about on hundreds of legs and slaughtered every human they could find, their black carapaces slick with the blood of their victims. They were made of a foreign metal that alternated between malleable and unbreakable, seemingly on a whim, allowing them the fluidity necessary to fit through any gap with a rigidity that was far stronger than any man, made material. 
Onward, they slithered, crawled, jumped, and everything in between as they spread their carnage throughout the world. Armies the world over converged on them, but they were simultaneously too elusive and impenetrable for conventional weapons. To have any noticeable effect, they were a tide, and we were nothing but flotsam in their wake. After a week of wanton slaughter which resulted in the deaths of about three-quarters of the human population, what I refer to as Phase 2 of their operation began. Their main target became our communication hubs, radio towers, satellite receivers, power plants, and the power grid itself. They realized that our communication channels allowed the survivors to anticipate attacks and warn each other of abyssalian movements, and they sought to isolate us. I was lucky enough to have a neighbor named Luke, who was a doomsday prepper, and he invited some local families into his well-stocked bunker. After a few weeks of systematically destroying the world's infrastructure, our small clan of survivors was left with only one radio station that we could tune into, and our only sources of power were a few shoddy generators. Occasionally, the radio broadcast would be interrupted with a chilling message. I am Abelonis, hive mother of the Abyssalian. Repent for your sins and die for your blasphemy and be remade into something new. This broadcast marked phase three of their invasion. The appearance of Abelonis. We now knew the name of the enemy and their so-called hive mother, but we were no closer to knowing a way to stop them. A hulking mechanical anomaly could occasionally be seen prowling the horizon miles away, and it emitted a discordant, low-pitched hum which could be heard from dozens of miles away. Its figure would blot out the sky as it approached, and each appearance would be accompanied by the radio broadcasting the same message. I am Abelonis, hive mother of the Abyssalian. Repent for your sins and die for your blasphemy, and be remade into something new. Between these interruptions... The radio station would send brief reports catered toward the local survivor encampments. The station would broadcast its location and encourage local encampments to send messengers, otherwise known as runners, to the station to hand, deliver information so that this information could be broadcast to other encampments. In retrospect, if Phase 2 was designed to isolate us, Phase 3 was designed to psychologically break us. My assumption is that the Abyssalian likely kept a small number of radio towers intact so that the bare minimum amount of information could be broadcast. It was just enough information to provide the survivors with a steady dose of despair while allowing the Abyssalian to occasionally pick off runners who were flushed out of hiding by the desire to deliver this information to the station. Week after week, the station would report on which encampments had dispatched runners, and this number would steadily decline as time passed. After months of enduring the cacophonous hums of the monstrous hive Mother Abelonis stalking nearby, I was reaching my breaking point, huddling with my head between my knees. Then one morning shortly after Abelonis appeared, on the horizon, it emitted a high-pitched whine and shuddered, crumpling into a heap of dust and debris. A fine, charcoal-colored mist rose from Abelonis' form and twisted into the sky, and it was joined by thousands of smaller but similar clouds of mist reaching heavenward. We were in awe. What could have felled Abelonis? Seeking a higher vantage point, we trekked for the entire day as we made our way to the top of Spruce Mountain, the highest mountain in the region. When we arrived, we noticed that other survivor encampments had a similar idea. Our group of eight was joined by another two. Dozen survivors, although they all looked quite a bit more ragged than we did. The one exception was a blonde young woman standing off to the side of the clearing, and she had a haughty smirk as she leaned against a nearby tree. Her complexion appeared so healthy that she was practically glowing. Next to her slouched an ashen-skinned, rail-thin man with his head in his hands. When Luke asked if anyone else knew what had happened, a wizened old man from another encampment spoke up. A man from our encampment named August was growing wary of Abelonis. It was getting closer to our encampment every day, and we were just biding our time until it finally found us. All of us knew it, but we were too afraid to admit it. August left this morning and took an old spear with him, saying something about how he wouldn't just sit around and wait to die, and that he would make his last stand against Abelonis with his father's sacred spear. I have no idea what he meant by that, but sure enough, 
He left our encampment with a strange spear in hand and made his way toward Avalonis. An hour or so later we heard that unholy racket, but it couldn't have been the work of a single spear, could it? On the contrary, spoke the haughty woman as she sauntered toward the center of the clearing and away from her ashen companion. That spear did indeed fell a balanus, although I know not how it became defiled with the blood of a god. Sadly, August did not survive his heroism. Regardless, a weapon infused with a god's blood is powerful enough to incapacitate, if not kill, just about anything in the multiverse. My mouth agape, I interjected. Are you mad? A god's blood? The multiverse. The woman laughed. I'm a bit mad, yes, but I'm also your goddess, the goddess of life. Call me Lumineer. Red-faced, I shouted. So you let us be slaughtered like animals as we hid away in our bunkers waiting to die. Lumineer waved her hand dismissively, as if you would have been the first species to meet its end. Should I have intervened to save the countless species that have been erased at the hands of men? So what made you change your mind and bless us with your presence? Oh, mighty one, I responded with a sneer. She glowered and chided. Two things. First, although I typically frown on meddling in the affairs of my creations, they've never exactly faced a trans-dimensional threat. However, that alone wasn't enough to sway me. Above all, I value the tenacity and free will of my creations, so I strive to let them attempt to solve their own problems, however dire they may be. When August sacrificed himself to cripple Abelonus against all odds, he proved that mankind had the resourcefulness to survive this threat, assuming they have a bit of divine power on their side. In short, you finally proved that you are deserving of my involvement, so don't be petulant now that you have it. Fuming, I could hardly think of a response. Luke, who was previously sitting thoughtfully on a stump, asked, So you're saying this isn't over yet? Lumineer replied, Far from it. The mist you saw was the Abyssalian, including Abelonus, abandoning their material shells, but the Abyssalian themselves have no physical bodies. They are beings which excel at transforming, manipulating, and inhabiting inanimate objects, so we've only managed to repel them for now. This is only the beginning of a long war, and when Abelonis makes her appearance again, I doubt she will underestimate us the next time around. However, I'm not expert in the Abyssalian, so it's fortunate that their creator is here to speak on their behalf. Let me introduce my failure of a brother, the god of the bloodthirsty Abyssalian. The ashen-skinned man slowly lifted his head above his hands and droned pleased to make your acquaintance before dropping his head again with a defeated sigh. It all started, at least for me, in the summer of 2008. It was my first year out as a park ranger, where I wasn't having to follow some experienced ranger around like a sad little puppy dog. I had my posting and my park, and life was good. I remember the day I moved in, the soft, comforting patter of rain on the old tin roof, and the feeling of the cool water as it dribbled off my hat onto my back. Sure, I was wet, but I was wet bark. But I was the head ranger, and this was my park. It took me a couple days to get settled, and that's when I met my partner, Sam. Well, Samantha, but God help anyone that called her anything other than Sam. Sam and I would, over the years, become very close. I shouldn't have to explain what I mean by that. I wager you can guess. Sam had one year seniority over me, and yet she had turned down the head ranger position in favor of staying at the park we were assigned to. Even though I was the boss, I still tended to defer to Sam on all manner of decisions. She'd been at the park longer than I had, so she obviously knew more. After I'd settled in, Sam dropped by to check on me, and then tell me more about the park I was now in charge of. All told, the park covered some 5,000 acres of forested land, as well as another 1,000 acres of lake. The lake itself had been built in the 50s, as part of some government project to draw more people to the park, fishing, boating, swimming, that kind of thing. And then later the camp was built. Well, the first camp. There were actually two summer camps located in the park. The first camp had been built in the 1950s and was located directly across the lake from the rangers' residences. The second camp was newer, 
and dated back to the 1990s, and was maybe 10 or 11 years old. I was never sure how old by the time I arrived there. The first camp, called Camp Pinewood or something similar, had been abandoned in 1975 after an incident at the camp. I remember asking Sam just what the incident was, and she became rather evasive about it, finally telling me that in a couple days the judge would stop by and tell me the story. The second camp, located some 1,000 yards down the hill from the rangers' residences, was called Camp Hope and was a special camp. Again, the judge would explain things to me in a couple days. For now, I just needed to get settled in and wait. Yay, my first own park and I can do fall at it because I had to have things explained to me. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Sam seemed to understand my frustrations, or sense them, or something, because she just told me that things were done differently here when compared to other parks, and there were some rules I needed to know. Until I spoke with the judge, it wouldn't do me any good for her to try to explain things. Thankfully, it didn't take long, maybe another day, for the judge to show up on my doorstep. He reminded me of the stereotypical small-town judge featured in so many movies, and while he spoke with a deep southern drawl and looked as if a stiff wind would have blown him over, his handshake was very firm, and his mannerism spoke of a great deal of hidden strength. Sitting down at my dining room table, he spread out some papers and began to talk. The first camp, Pinewood, had not been simply abandoned. Rather, in 1975, just days short of the July 4th celebrations, there had been a fire at the camp. This fire destroyed one wing of the camp's communal building and damaged several of the camp bunkhouses. When the dust settled, 16 campers were injured, two killed, and one had simply vanished. The state police investigated the fire and the missing camper before ultimately the case just went cold. That camper was one Millicent Billy McIntyre, and it was generally believed by the authorities that she had set the fire herself and then fled the state. Granted, no one knew how she had pulled this feat off, but that was the going theory in 75. In the 90s, Camp Hope was created, opposite the old camp which on a clear day you could still see some remnants of across the lake. Camp Hope was a special year-round camp, though it also had summer programs as well. The camp was filled with various juvenile offenders and was treated more like an outdoors version of juvenile detention, as well as education. I think the word he used was a diversionary program, where youth offenders could get away from the corrupting aspects of their homes and get a new lease on life. At least, that was the intent. Camp Hope had its own civilian staff, who would handle most everything, while the rangers were there in case, as the judge put it, anything went wrong. That's one hell of a vague term, and asking for clarification didn't prompt anything beyond him giving me his personal phone and telling me that I'd know when to call him if the need arose. As he stood to leave, he paused by the door and looked back to me. Warning, there's one final thing you should know, he said, his words a grave whisper. I don't think Billy ever left Pinewood. In fact, I'd be willing to bet she's still out there. Somewhere, and damned angry that she's been forgotten. With that, he swept out of my home and left. The next several weeks were a blur. A couple of the new campers attempted escapes and needed tracked down and rescued from various spots in the forest, while one made it as far as the gate itself, only to get turned back by Sam, who was doing her hourly patrols. I kept busy scheduling various repairs for the park and touching base with the various counselors and the director for Camp Hope. I even approved a special trust-building event where the campers would go out into the forest and using only a map and compass traverse over a path finding various checkpoints. The first camper to reach the end would win a bottle of coke. Quite the prize when you haven't had one in weeks. The counselor and director were excited to see how well the campers worked together, while Sam and I were going to just hang around for the inevitable call that someone had gotten lost again. We didn't have to wait long. I was taking a break after a foot patrol of the grounds when Sam came wandering over from her residence to see what I was doing. That, or to annoy me with a complaint that I still needed to get her porch painted, and sitting on my ass wasn't doing any good. All in all, just fun ribbing from co-workers. No real harm in it. 
I remember tossing a scrap of paper at her, prompting her to threaten to fight me for littering when one of the counselors came running up the path at a jog. Out of breath and sweaty, the counselor took several minutes to catch his breath before he gasped out that one of the campers had gone missing. Sam looked at me, then back to the counselor. All playfulness was gone, and it was down to business. When did you notice? she asked, pulling out a pad to make a note for her report later. The counselor seemed to dodge the question before eventually saying that it was on the navigations course. I offered to drive us down to where that was in my truck while Sam questioned the counselor. The counselor wasn't really sure when the camper went missing, just that they hadn't showed up at the fourth checkpoint. Figuring the girl in question had gotten a bit lost, they opted to wait it out to see if she showed up. When she didn't, they started walking back along the paths to the third checkpoint, calling the girl's name and searching for her. At the third checkpoint, the counselor there noted that the girl had passed him some twenty minutes prior, but hadn't seen hide nor hair of her after that. Between that, and the jog up to come grab myself and Sam, as well as a stop off at the director's office to notify them, a good hour and a half, maybe two hours had passed. Crap! This wasn't good. We dropped the counselor off, and I started to get out of the truck when I felt Sam's hand on my arm. I think I know where she is, Sam said levelly and told me to close the door. I gave her an odd look, and she simply replied Pinewood. I must have looked at her like she had a horn growing out of her forehead, because she just sighed, trust me on this. It, well, it happens maybe once or twice a year. A camper goes missing, and we find them wandering around Pinewood. No one really knows how they get there, but it always happens. I rolled my eyes at that and snorted, to which she just looked darkly at me. I've been here longer than you, and I've seen things that I can't explain. There's something wrong with this place, and I can't quite explain it. If you don't believe me, just ask the judge, he'll tell you. I just gave up at that point, looking out at the masked counselors, no doubt wondering why we'd not left the truck and back to her. You better be right, I just said. She rolled down her window and spoke with one of the counselors, saying something about having a good idea where the girl was, and then nodded at me to leave. I won't tell you about the drive to Pinewood on the other side of the lake. Not because it's some horrific tale of dead trees and overgrown road, but because I don't really remember it. Not all of it, at least. I have flashes of it from time to time, but it's only the last thing I have any real memory of. The drive felt like it took hours, though only a few minutes passed, and then we were at the gates of Camp Pinewood. The sign over the road, long since overgrown and forgotten, the gates, themselves ajar and rusted in place. In the distance, lumps in the grass from long discarded clothing, or bags from the campers back in 75 who fled the place in a hurry, and then what was left of the cabins, many had the blackened damage from an old fire, while others looked just run down. It didn't feel like a nice place, though I could almost imagine that once it was a happy place where children looked forward to going. Now, though, it was a skeleton of its former glory. In the center of that grassy expanse stood an emaciated figure, a girl in torn shorts and an equally torn shirt. Wit, she turned and saw me, her eyes sunken deeply into her head. She broke out in a scream and ran, not away from me, but toward me wrapping me up in a bony hug as she began to sob over and over again, saying she was sorry and had been so scared. I remember picking up this waif of a girl, the bones of her elbows digging into my arm as I cradled and walked back to the truck, Sam waiting patiently for me. I half expected the girl to vanish the moment I crossed past where the gates were, but she did not. She just clung to me and then to Sam. All the while babbling on and on about how she was sorry and really wanted to go home. As we drove back to the camp, I listened to her story. She told how three weeks prior she'd met a girl on the trail while doing that navigation thing. The girl had suggested they sneak away for a cigarette, and in doing so she'd gotten lost. She wasn't sure where she was, but told how she'd walked in circles for a couple days before stumbling across the old camp. There she'd found food in some of the buildings and had been sleeping in the cabins. She told how she'd seen the other girl a few times, always standing back and laughing at her, only to vanish when the girl blinked or wiped her eyes. The few times the other girl spoke, it was accusing her, saying that it had all been her fault and to just accept her fate. She'd tried running away from this other girl, 
only to find that no matter where she turned, she always seemed to end up back where she'd started. By the end of it, she'd pretty much given up hope of ever being found and was considering hanging herself when I found her. Three weeks. She was certain of that. She'd been gone three weeks. She'd been gone three weeks. She'd been missing, at most, three hours, not three weeks. Yet, here she was, skin and bones, her clothing tattered and torn, and convinced that she'd been gone three weeks. Sam and I dropped her off at the infirmary, with the doctor giving her a once-over and then helping her settle in. The doc actually behaved as though it was a perfectly normal thing, from her condition to the weird time Skip the girl had experienced. I found myself walking out of the infirmary knowing less than I had when I went into it. So much just didn't make sense about everything. I found Sam sitting in the bed of my truck, idly smoking. When she saw me approaching, she wordlessly pulled out her phone and held it out to me. I just dumbly shook my head, not sure what exactly to do or say. She pursed her lips at this, then gave a curt nod and pushed the dial button. It must have only rang once because before long I heard her say two simple words. Billy's back. She then hung up the phone and looked at me, adding, we need to talk. I'm going to leave this here for now, as I have a long day ahead of me tomorrow, and I really don't want to get complained at by Sam for daring to stay up too late once more. I don't know if my story is what you're used to, or if there's answers to the many questions I have, even to this day, about it. But I do promise I will update this when possible. I'm an environmental educator at a nature preserve, so I spend a lot of time outdoors in sometimes isolated areas. There's one area of the park I try not to take groups of kids anymore. Once in a while, we have to go through that trail, since it's a shortcut to the kayak launch, and when it's 95 degrees outside, you're ready for anything that'll make your trip shorter. When I started there, one of the first things I did was to familiarize myself with all areas of the preserve. So I spent quite a bit of time hiking through all of the trails, even the rarely used ones, since I have to know my way around to navigate groups or go rescue someone if they get lost, which happens. One part of the preserve is an old homestead site of a now-abandoned pineapple plantation. It was settled in the 1890s. We don't know much about the family beyond the name and the approximate year they settled there, and the approximate year they settled there, and the approximate year the homestead was abandoned. This is in southern Florida, and there are thousands of similarly abandoned homestead sites. The early settlers of that area had to be tough as nails. This was pre-railroad area. The nearest town was about five miles south, through what would have been wilderness with no real roads. So these guys were on their own, in a land absolutely bursting with mosquitoes, panthers, bears, and bad water. Water table is high, and fresh water can be easily contaminated by the salt water nearby. In other words, early homesteaders were badasses because that was the only way they'd survive. There is a narrow trail through what was once the homestead site. On one of my first days, I decided to trek through there. I got about a half mile in when I started to get some weird vibes. I've always been sensitive to my surroundings and have spent enough time in isolated natural areas to know that if something doesn't feel right, it probably means your instincts are picking up on something you should pay attention to. Usually this means your brain is picking up on minute movements on the ground that indicate an unfriendly snake may be nearby or another animal you don't want to confront while the panthers are nearly gone. We've got aggressive wild boars and bobcats that freely roam. So I stopped dead in my tracks and let my mind go quiet, looking around carefully for any warning signs. There weren't any, and I didn't see any recent tracks, but the bad vibe feeling was still there. I shrugged it off and kept going, the trail getting narrower. And the bad vibes kept growing deep in my gut. I felt I was being watched and followed. Now, this is an isolated area, so the possibility that a person was following me was remote. The possibility that a person was following me was remote, or possible. I stopped every few meters, but there were no sounds. Actually, none at all. Not even birds. I started to sweat, and my heart started to race. One thought kept echoing in my mind. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome here. Turn around. You are not welcome. Well, of that, I thought. Just jittery from nervous new job feeling, I thought. I came to a bend in the trail, and I stopped. My feet would go no further. 
in my mind, the phrase got louder and louder. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome here. I heard a crash coming from behind me, but when I turned to investigate, there was no one. Not animal, not human. Nothing. The vegetation was sparse enough I would have been able to see something. I turned around and left. I put it down to nerves, or me being a wimp or something, and sort of forgot about it. About a month later, I'm taking a camp group through to the kayak launch where our kayaks await us. I decided to take the kids through the narrow trail to save us about ten minutes. We get to the same bend of the trail, and the kids have gone silent. These are nine-year-olds in summer camp. They are not silent. They're never silent. I look behind me to one kid who looks as though he's scared shitless. I don't like it here, he said. Why not? I asked. He looked me dead in the eye and said I feel like we shouldn't be here. I couldn't turn around at that point. So we hustled to the kayak launch and all was well, but we were all a little on edge. I took another group through the trail a week later, and again the kids were silent at that bend in the trail. For that whole summer, whenever I took the shortcut, kids would get silent and I'd get those bad vibes. I try not to go down that stretch of trail anymore if I can help it. Obviously, this is nothing more than a gut feeling on my end, but only a few other times in my life have I felt a gut feeling about a place that strongly. I don't know if it's the spirit of whatever homesteader was there or something else, and it's hard to describe, but it doesn't want people trespassing. As far as I know, it's never hurt anyone, but it seems to make everyone feel the same way. You're not welcome. Not a park ranger, but I hunt. When I say I hunt, I don't mean I sit in a tree stand. I mean, I'm the guy out hunting by walking over the entire park with enough on my back to let me sleep at night. Sort of comfortably, but little enough I won't mind dragging 150 biobes of yummy out of the woods. All right, so I'm hunting a fairly large forest somewhere in the northeast corridor of the U.S. It's not uncommon to run into other people at the edges of the woods, it's fairly uncommon to run into people in the middle of the woods. Even during hunting season, unless you're on the trails, which I wasn't, and it's decently common to run into the ruins of buildings from the 1800s. I happened to be hunting a new valley I was pretty sure had a crossing in it, so, to set the view, I'm sitting on the top of a very steep shale slide, looking down into a valley with a creek running through it. Approaching this plateau, there's a knife edge that runs up and down the ridge, but there's really no way to get up to this spot except for the seriously determined, the drunk, and the foolish without walking up or down the edge. Getting up here creates quite a noise from the stones sliding on the stones, which means I know I need to sit up here for an hour to let things settle back down after I made the ascent. Since it's such a pain in the ass, I left my day pack at the bottom under a pine tree and only had a rifle, binoculars, water, and an energy bar. I'm up here for about three hours glassing this little piss of a stream, looking for something to cross it and seeing nothing but squirrels and birds, and I finally decide to start glassing the opposite hill out of sheer boredom. I am ninety sure I chose a poor spot and wasted an afternoon looking at nothing. Such is hunting. It's got really interesting days, and it's got really interesting days, and it's got really boring days, and this is why it's called hunting and not shooting. As I'm screwing around with the focus on the binoculars, I catch a glimpse of something which almost looks like a person if they were wearing dark blue clothes and about four foot tall, ninety-nines of the time the day hikers just pass by, without realizing I'm here even with the blaze orange requirements. Or they pretend to ignore me, but you'd be amazed how many times someone has almost walked through my stand. Anyway... This person wasn't moving, which started to make me think I was wrong. It was just standing there behind the cover of some low scrub brush and tree branches, and I would have missed it were it not for the color. I zoom out a bit and realize I'm not looking at a person, but it's actually a collapsed cabin, and I was looking at where the door would be. Except it really looked like a person, and cabins aren't blue. I move the zoom back onto the door and play with the focus for about five minutes, and I can't get the person to come back. In fact, the cabin door now has some light from the setting sun visible through the holes in the walls and roof. Whatever forfed tall thing I was looking at has moved. Sigh. Teenagers, right? 
I have that thought and then realize something else. I still can hear birds and squirrels and all the other things in the woods, which typically go quiet when they notice something, which means that they didn't notice me, but that also means they didn't notice whatever was in the cabin door a short time ago. I'm doing my best to stay quiet and not move, and whatever it was certainly did move. I would expect everything in the woods to have gone for cover with a teenager crashing through the brush, but the noises almost made it worse. There was stuff moving in the brush. The problem was, stuff was moving around in the brush. I started to think it was a trick of the light, since the sun was setting, and it was getting to the part of the day when tree stumps looked like deer. I knew I would have to move soon, and figured I might as well pack it up since I still had to get down off the shale and back to the pine tree where I had planned to throw a tarp and sleep. At this time, I realized it wasn't dark, per se, but it was overcast now. Again, the creepy experience isn't that there's something obviously wrong. It's that everything is so completely normal for what I would expect were I alone. About this time, a fog rolled into the valley which the combination of overcast weather conditions, sunset, and a ground fog coming up in the wet, low valley had signaled it was time to leave. I checked my safety, put the caps on my glass, and reached up to take down my orange flag. The moment I grabbed the flag, the dread came. That's the only way to describe it. The woods went from animals going home to sleep to full-on you're done. The movement had attracted what I could only describe as a thousand invisible eyes which all turned in unison as they noticed me. Even wonder what a deer feels in the headlights. This is it. Then I heard children. I heard children laughing. Not teenagers. Not adults. Not women. But full-on five-year-old kids laughing like they caught a firefly. I had hiked in five miles the previous day through woods and put down two more today when I woke up to get to this spot, and I distinctly hear children laughing during what I could only describe as the most creepy moment I've ever had in a valley I know is completely unoccupied, having stared at it for. The last four hours or so, I am pretty sure my feet only touched the shale three times getting down from the knife edge, and I made a ton of noises doing it too. At this point, I didn't really care. I grabbed the pack and my flashlight and absolutely full-on rucked and absolutely full-on rucked it to the next hill too. I killed my light halfway up the hill and then went to the top of the hill where I threw down the tarp and unrolled my foam. And there I sat all night watching the hill I just came from. 